Celtic folklore is full of terrifying creatures that will drink your blood, eat your children, and even make passionate love to you if you ask them nicely enough. And sure, Mike Tyson has claimed to engage in all of these activities too, but this isn't a boxing channel, it's a folklore and myth channel. And in honor of St. Patrick's Day earlier this week, we're exploring the mythology of the Emerald Isle and other Celtic countries. This is also a little bit in honor of the messed up Origins field trip to Ireland being less than three months away. And by the way, we had a few spots open up last minute, so if you're interested in joining us, hit the Trova Trip link in the description. For the rest of yous, it's time we dive into the messed up mythology of three Celtic creatures that'll make you pee your pants. Or whatever I'm gonna call this episode. Disclaimer, the way that Celtic words are written in English looks very different than how they're pronounced. And while I'm going to do my best to say them correctly in their native tongue, I am not an expert. And those of you who do speak the language are probably going to get irritated at me. So, sorry in advance. Prime example, our very first figure, whose name is spelled Abhartak, but if the pronunciation guides I listen to are to be trusted, is said like Avertag. The word Avertag is Irish for dwarf, but it's not just referring to any old dwarf. Avertag was a clan leader in Northern Ireland who ruled over his citizens with an iron fist, and some say was the inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. The earliest written mention of him is in a book called The Origin and History of Irish Names and Places, written by Patrick Weston Joyce and published in 1870. When describing the name of a place called Slotaverdi, again, sorry for the mispronunciation, he says there's a monument there dedicated to Avertag, and then tells us a little bit of Avertag's story. According to Joyce, Avertag was a magician and a cruel tyrant who was feared by his own people and the clans neighboring his. His citizens prayed for a hero, and the gods blessed them with Finn McCool, who easily slew Avertag and then buried his body. What Finn and his people never could have expected was for Avertag to return but this time even more evil. Because in order to sustain his new undead form, he had to ingest the blood of the living. So he crept around the town at night and drained anyone foolish enough to be alone and defenseless. Once again, Finn McCool took up his arms and battled the blood-sucking dwarf. And once again, he killed him with relative ease. This time, destroying his body to ensure he could never rise again. But his efforts were in vain because the very next night, Avertag was seen again, fleeing the house of another blood barren victim. At this point, Finn McCool wasn't willing to risk another dwarf vampire rebirth, so he sought out a druid to learn how to kill this seemingly immortal man for good and the druid gave him some very specific instructions. First, he said that Finn would have to make a sword from the wood of a yew tree, which was considered sacred in Celtic folklore and affiliated with the cycle of death and rebirth. Second, Finn would have to bury the dwarf's body upside down, because for some reason being upside down suppressed the dwarf magician's power. Well, Finn met Avertag in battle one last time, plunged his wooden sword through his chest, and buried his body upside down cursing him with the eternal sleep that his dark magic almost allowed him to avoid. Now, like a lot of folktales, Avertag's story has evolved over the years, and in one pretty hilarious variant, his initial death is caused by his own stupidity. While hanging from the windowsill of his bedroom, trying to catch his wife cheating on him, he slips and falls to his death. The citizens rejoice that their tyrannical ruler is dead and bury his body, but to their disappointment, he's reborn the next day and demands that his citizens give him bowls of blood so he can maintain his undead form. In this version, the savior isn't Finn McCool, but a warrior named Cathane and instead of seeking out a druid for advice on how to kill Avertag, he visits a saint. The rest of the story is pretty much identical though, and always ends with the citizens feeling safe and never having an undead dwarf try to drink their blood ever again. Can you believe the things that people centuries ago had to worry about? Like here I am, afraid to poop in a public restroom, meanwhile these folks went to sleep thinking they could wake up to a dwarf sucking blood from their neck. I've never dealt with something that scary. That's one thing I love about folklore. It always puts the safety and accessibility of the modern world into perspective, just like today's sponsor, Squarespace. Having your own website can be a game changer when it comes to running your own business, marketing yourself, or getting your passion project off the ground. 
That's why I love today's sponsor. Squarespace takes the intimidating task of building a website and puts it on easy mode. With the revolutionary Fluid Engine, they've made it possible to design a beautiful website without knowing how to code. You can just drag and drop assets wherever you want them. And you can have confidence that your site is gonna look good because Squarespace offers dozens of award-winning design templates that you can easily add your personality to. What has to be the best part of Squarespace though is that all of this can be done inside your web browser so you never have to download or install any software or patches. Take it from me, I've been using Squarespace to host MessedUpOrigins.com for over five years and I've never had to download a thing. So if you want to join me in taking your small business, side hustle, or passion project to the next level, go to Squarespace.com slash John Solo to start a free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Selkies might be our most highly requested Celtic creature to cover, and for good reason. Not only are they beautiful, they're also creepy as hell. And when you juxtapose those two contradictory qualities, the results are always mind-bending. You can think of selkies as Celtic mermaids or sirens. They're sea folk human hybrids who become seals when they enter the water, but can take off their seal skin when they get to land and become human usually a sexy human. While in this form, they'll seduce and even reproduce with a human, but eventually they'll return to the sea and take their child with them. Now, to be fair to Selkies, it isn't actually their intention to hurt humans, which is what sets them apart from mermaids and sirens. They love hanging out on the shore as a novelty, singing, dancing, and basking in the sun, but they're happiest in their natural seal form and in their natural environment. And so the moment they think it's possible to return to the ocean life they left behind when they met their lover on land, they will. That being said, the heartbreak that men and women had to experience when they returned home to find their lover and child missing would be excruciating. Even worse when you consider that once Selkies leave land, they rarely return. There is a way to prevent this from happening though, and you're gonna wanna hear it. If you ever find yourself falling in love with a Selkie, you have to hide their seal skin. I know, it sounds messed up, but without their seal skin, they can't return to the ocean, so you don't have to worry about being outright abandoned. And maybe more importantly, you won't have to explain to your family and friends why your spouse and child suddenly disappeared and potentially get charged with murder or thrown in the loony bin for saying she was a seal person. Now, most stories about Selkies follow a similar structure to the Swan Maiden stories I discussed in my episode on the Swan Princess. A Selkie woman comes to land, her husband hides her seal skin, she eventually finds it and returns to the ocean forever. But the following tale has a little more going on, giving us a fantastical origin for Selkies and even bears a subtle resemblance to Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. In the story's first act, a sea witch convinces a sea king to marry her but she's ugly and spiteful and hates his children. So she curses them to transform into seals who can only return to their humanoid form one day a year. Later in the story, the king's daughter gets stranded on land in her human form and a fisherman who falls in love with her at first sight welcomes her into his home. And before long, a romance kindles and they start having children. A few years down the line though, tragedy strikes, literally. The fisherman went out to sea during a storm, despite his wife telling him not to, and his boat was blown to bits by lightning. The selkie woman saw this happen from the shoreline, but she had no way to save him. Yet. Fortunately, the lightning strike that destroyed her husband's boat also caused a hidden key to fall from her home's rafters, and her kids quickly realized that it must open the treasure chest that their father hid under his bed. The moment they opened the chest, she was hit with a familiar aroma that could only mean one thing. Her seal skin was in that chest. It turned out her husband had been storing it for years, unbeknownst to him that it belonged to her and she knew right away what she had to do. She grabbed the seal skin, kissed each one of her children on the head, and sprinted to the sea, wrapping herself in the skin as she ran. The moment she hit the water, she returned to her natural seal form, which allowed her to quickly swim out to her husband's wrecked ship, find him clinging to a floating barrel, and drag his unconscious body to the shore. He never would know who it was that saved him though, because the Selkie had violated the witch's law stating that she could only be in human form for one day. As a result, she was cursed to remain a seal forever. That is some heavy shit, isn't it? 
Like, I know that deep down she wanted to go back to the ocean, but to have to make that choice between her kids losing their father or their mother, that's some impossible sh and she chose the most heroic route. That's just one of the reasons why I said it reminds me of the Little Mermaid, who sacrificed her life for the man that she loved. This next Celtic character is on the opposite side of the hero spectrum, though. Our next figure, Balor, is the biggest and scariest of today's subjects, but that's not the only reason I'm talking about him. His story has a surprising amount of overlap with the Greek hero Perseus, or should I say Perseus's grandfather, Acrisius. And like Acrisius, Balor is a villain. He's the leader of the Fomorians, an evil group of supernatural beings believed to represent the destructive power of nature and who had a feud with the Tuatha de Danann, Celtic gods who were worshipped before Christianity took over. Balor was blessed with dangerous and deadly powers when he was just a young lad. While spying on his father and a group of druids concocting a spell of death, the magical fumes entered his eye, and from then on, he had a gaze of death that could kill anything he looked at. Kind of overpowered if you ask me, but there is a trade-off. Balor's eyelid is so heavy that it takes anywhere from four to ten men to lift it up, and whenever they do, its destructive power is unleashed. Now, to be clear, there are some descriptions of Balor where he has two eyes, and one of them has the touch of death, for lack of a better term, but there are some accounts that describe him with one giant eye in the middle of his forehead, like a cyclops. Personally, I pictured him as a cyclops, but thinking about it now, if his one eyelid is so heavy that it needs help to lift up, that means it's probably closed most of the time. And unless he's walking around with his one eye closed all day, I'm assuming he has a second one to help him navigate the world. Doesn't really matter either way, but I know the art piece I commissioned will only have one eye because that's how I told Marcus to draw it, so I felt inclined to explain myself. Anyway, Balor grew up to be the most powerful leader the Fomorians ever had, but similar to Perseus's grandfather, King Acrisius, his rule was threatened by a prophecy that his grandson would kill him. But wait, because there's more. To stop this prophecy from coming true, Balor followed in Acrisius' footsteps by imprisoning his daughter in a tower where she could never get pregnant. Yet somehow, a god managed to find his way in. Now, unlike Zeus, who simply had an infatuation with Danny and no grudge against her father, Balor became the target of a god named Sion after he stole the god's divine cow. Sion wanted his cow back, but knew this would only be possible if Balor was dead and word had gotten around that only Balor's grandson would be able to kill him. So Sion, playing the long game, broke into Balor's daughter's tower, seduced her, and got her pregnant with triplets. Depending on the version, Balor's daughter either tries to save the triplets herself by putting them on a boat and sending them away from her island prison, or Balor finds out about them and sends them out to sea himself. Either way, this leads to two of the triplets drowning, while one, who would go on to be named Lug, survives. We aren't told much about Lug's upbringing, but he grows up to be a powerful warrior who battles against Balor's forces on multiple occasions, without Balor realizing who he is until their final encounter at the Battle of Moitura. Just like how Perseus had to use a reflective shield to avoid Medusa's petrifying gaze, Lug had to find a way to render Balor's death stare useless. So he used a slingshot shot to bullseye Balor in the eye, blinding him and sending him crashing to the ground where he flattened 27 of his own soldiers with his giant body. Some accounts say that Balor died at this moment and that his lone eye was blown out the back of his head, but others describe one final exchange between the grandfather and grandson. Lug jumps on the blinded Balor, races up to his neck, and is about to chop his big dumb head off when Balor makes him an offer. The giant says that if Lug chopped off his head and placed it on his own, he would be blessed with the same power and strength of Balor. And while this was tempting to take him up on, Lug knew that it wouldn't be that simple, so he sliced off Balor's head and threw it in the ocean. It's a good thing he did that too, because if he had put Balor's head on, it would have grafted itself to his body and taken him over. Instead, Lug gets a happy ending for now at least. His encounter with Balor is just one small part of his hero's journey, but if you want to hear more about Lug or another Celtic hero like Finn McCool, 
let me know in a comment. While you're at it, let me know what you thought about today's episode as a whole, and if you want to see more videos like this with creatures from other cultures. If you did enjoy this episode and learned yourself something, I would be eternally grateful if you sacrificed those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods because that goes a long way in supporting the channel and it'll ensure you get more messed up content sent to your sub box every Thursday, along with messed up shorts every other day of the week. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.